So um, I, I think the title of the talk was ontology, um, was um, a knowledge graph starter kit, but as there's lots of um, sort of knowledge graph uh, um, products out there, I think we wanted to distinguish a bit. So it's now called ontology-based application starter kit. Um, so it sort of starts from, um, and I think I can go over these slides quite quickly. Everyone's seen the, the fair um, definition many times, I think, in talks and, and will in lots of other talks in this, in this session, in this, uh, in this meeting. So uh, obviously part of making things findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is to annotate with commonly used um, or, or at least well-mapped ontologies and vocabularies and then to use standard schemas and formats. So say you've been a great citizen of, of, of the bio-curation world and you've got that far. Um, okay, so one reason obviously that um, it's useful to do this, and again, I think I can go over these reasonably fast, is annotating with ontologies. You get a, a standard link uh, that's persistent for the ontology term. You get a label you can search on. You get a bunch of synonyms you can search on. Um, in this case, annotations might involve, you know, so in this case, in the single cell atlas, we have annotations to, um, at the UBI, we have annotations to images. Um, so this cup for cell is annotated um, on this image. So it's another way that you could search. Uh, and there's links to, uh, to other ontologies as well for mapping. And obviously the, the structure of the ontology is something that's particularly, um, potentially very useful in, in improving findability. So in this case, a cup for cell, um, based on the structure of the ontology, you should be able to find it by looking for tissue resident macrophages or macrophages in general up the class hierarchy or going up the location and part hierarchy. You could, you could use it to find... Um, annotations for, in this case, for SCRNA-seq data sets in the liver or, or combinations of those. But um, that's all nice and theoretical, but actually how do, you, how do you make it work? So say you've been you know, a good citizen and you've got all of your stuff in, in nicely um, standard uh, structures, uh, standard schemas, annotated with ontologies, and you want to build some kind of application to support findability. Um, so how do we make that, that easy is really our starting point here. Um, so we've built this um, ontology-based application starter kit. It's really a set of, um, a very easily run set of configurable systems for launching a, a set of servers that you can potentially then build applications off of. Um, and it's something we're gradually, gradually expanding. Anyway, the basic idea is you can, you've got an extremely simple config. You can launch with a single um, Docker compose command and, and get, a, get the whole thing to run very rapidly. Um, one of the things that we have at the heart of it is this semantic tagging system. And the idea of the semantic tagging system is um, that uh, you know, ontologies themselves can be, they're incredibly rich in terms of being able to use the ontology structure to, to find things, but a lot of the time there's, there's a lot of complexity there which makes it hard. Um, so coming up with a simple system to, to use the power of the knowledge in the ontologies but to tag in simple ways um, for, in an applica for applications I, I think is a good approach. So, um, and by running this, you get a knowledge graph uh, with data and links to data. You can use the ontology structure for visualization and queries, and there's quite nice advanced tunable lexical search API as well. Okay, so this idea of semantic tags, um, you configure them using, um, you can configure them using Sparkle or using owl queries or a mix of the two. Um, so then you can take maybe the complexity which comes with how you've decided to represent a particular in our case for, for the fly brain work that I'll show in a minute, that particular cells are present in the larva. Um, then there's a, a, a query for that. It's kind of complex for people to incorporate that into a website, but if you can just make a little tag that says larva, then you can use that in display. You can use it in search configuration. You can use it to um, in faceted browsing, et cetera. So here's one example from virtual fly brain knowledge graph, which I'm gonna talk about more in a minute. Um, and you can see, um, there's a bunch of tags here. So there's the blue circle here is a serotonergic neuron. Um, the, uh, the orange are synaptic neuropole domains, so they're brain regions. That's something our users will understand. And there's tags for whether there's particular data available, so it has neuron connectivity is down there, et cetera. OK, so here's one example of a use of this um, in the Allen Cell Type Knowledge Explorer, a project we've worked on with the, uh, with the Allen Institute. And here you can see. Um, so in this case, we've got um, a comprehensive classification of cell types in the, in the motor cortex of three species. And here you can, um, 
with these tags, you can click on chandelier, which our users would know would, typically would refer to a chandelier cell, and you can find, um, you can find chandelier cells across species. And um, you know, as, this, as this extends, we're working to extend this to whole human brain, and this kind of tagging and searching, I think, is going to become increasingly useful to find stuff. Another thing you can do with this, um, so uh, a project of ours, the cell annotation platform, has um, uh, a bunch of requirements for users to be able to annotate data. One of them is to record species. Um, in the remit is to, to cover all metazoan, um, all metazoan species. Uh, but if you just do a simple autocomplete over two and a half million terms in an NCBI taxonomy, it often doesn't, doesn't really work very well to find what you want. Um, so our solution here is um, we tag for species, so there's, there's, a, there's a, an annotation on, on terms to say what the rank is. Um, so that, that gives us our, our set of all species. And then subclasses of metazoan, that's another tag, another thing we can display as well, potentially. And then also, that isn't quite enough, because if you then search for mouse, you'll find um, you know, uh, field mice and lots of other types of mice before you find most musculus. So then we have a curated set of terms for common species uh, that boosts. So, that also um, you know, covers humans, so if you search for human, you'll find Homo sapiens, you won't find Homo, Homo heidelbergensis near the top of the list, which is not as useful for um, single cell RNA-seq data, at least right now. Um, another example is uh, context-specific search. So in this case, um, uh, actually, so this is an old slide, which hasn't been updated for some reason, but the, um, in this case, the... Uh, uh, the context is the prostate gland, and um, the uh, having entered prostate gland, it then when you then choose cell types, it boosts cells in the prostate gland to the top of the list. It doesn't eliminate any other cells, but the idea is to nudge people towards using more specific terms, because often they'll find, if they just found epithelial cell generally, they might come up with that super general annotation, which is less useful to the, to the project. Um, and another example here is, um, search with is, is filters, so in this case, virtual, the virtual fly brain project, um, rather than deciding beforehand what's desirable, we just give people a bunch of options to be able to filter their auto-suggest. So if you only want adult, you could choose that, or you could exclude adult, etc. Okay, so probably slightly too busy slide. This is, uh, this is the basic pipeline. As I said, you don't, most users don't need to care about this stuff under the hood. You, to launch it, it's a simple configuration. Um, one command um, and you have everything up. But um, here, um, let's see if I can put that here. So, um, yeah, so there's an, at the heart of it is the semantic integration layer, which is a triple store which does a disambiguation, deduplication of lots of data. So things can come in in multiple ways um, and they'll get collapsed down. Um, the, so this uses. Um, uh, actually, there's, there's this Al, this Neo to Al, Al to Neo conversion. Sorry, just a minute. Okay. Um, what was I? Yes, so one input is the ontologies. Another input is a set of data. Now, this needs to be an Al, but we, we maintain a set of simple robot templates so that you can actually just enter as TSVs and get Al that incorporates. And I'll show most of the rest of the talk is showing slides, showing how that works. Configure your semantic tags here. You can turn on and use reasoning if that's applicable to your ontologies. And then we have this Al to Neo, Neo to Al conversion, which is, there's a lot of these around now, but this one's um, standardized for, optimized for easy visualization and querying, and I, I hope to kind of convince you of that in the next slides. And then there's a couple of endpoints here, neo 4 j endpoint, which is good for graphs and metadata. You can potentially query that and cache that in Solar to make your website fast. Um, but then we have this nicely tunable auto-suggest service here. Um, and this is sort of, the standard tuning is already very good for ontology searches, but then you can do the kinds of things that I showed in the previous slides where you filter and boost, etc. cetera. Um, so as I said, simple config, um, single command, uh, and you have all these servers up and ready. So main projects I'm gonna talk about is the Virtual Flybrain project. Uh, we actually have over 9,000, that's a bit out of date, over 9,000 neuron types in there. 120,000 3D images, full connectomes, and it's all sort of in this nice queryable set up as well. Um, okay, so to, to look at the, I hope this is, this is visible, but to see the, the Neo4j to AL conversion. Um, 
So here's a bit of Owl up top. Some of you are probably used to seeing this. So there's a, uh, there's a label, there's a definition and a publication and some relationships. This gets turned into this nice readable graph with readable edges. You can render it by the, by the, um, the semantic tag. So in this case, here's a publication, etc. cetera. Um, and there's all of the annotation information in there. And we can already use this structure, for example, here's a relation to the, to the um, superior clamp, which is a part of the brain, and we can use, it, we can use a query over this graph to find, um, I can't read that, anyway, 800 and something neurons in the, uh, uh, in the superior clamp. Here's an example, so um, here's some examples of, of how data is added. I've actually, a couple of slides on, I'll, I can show you some of the tables that we use, TSVs we use to add data. So um, the, uh, here's a neuron, this, sorry, here's, this column is neuron, so this is a class in the ontology, and this is an instance of that neuron type, which comes from a connectome. Um, and then we also have um, a class for the, uh, for the image, so the type of image, it's transmission electron microscopy, and here's the instance of that, and we have this simple depict relationship here. The database, we have 120,000, over 120,000 3D images, but we only have a few brains, so there's lots of cross-registration. These come from different brains, and they're cross-registered onto the same standard template. So we need to be able to record that cross-registration. Cross some, some images are registered to more than one template. Um, you can see a nice, pretty template down here. And then on this edge here, we record um, links to the actual files and in, um, further information about the files. OK, so this is what it looks like in the website. So here's a whole brain with a bunch of there's a, some brain regions highlighted, some neurons on it. Um, this graph here is just auto-generated. All we need to do is... Um, uh, annot is annotate all of the domains correctly and it will just construct a graph for us, a tree, so you can, you can browse um, easily the anatomical structures. Here's a key for the, the things uh, actually on this 3D image, so there's, uh, there's some neurons, etc. Um, and here's the general metadata about the, about the neuron, um, and here's another query. So in this case, I can find uh, several hundred um, 172 images of, of a wedge projection neuron, which is the general type that covers these. Okay. Um, so, example of adding numeric data. Here's a, an example of a little bit of a TSV that we use to add connectomic data. So we just we plug directly into the um, connectomics databases and we just generate these TSVs from there. And we, these are increasingly getting more sophisticated, but the, the simple representation right now. Here's a pair of neurons, and this is just the number of synapses that connect those two neurons. So it's a pretty simple spreadsheet to upload this whole connectome. Um, and uh, each of these neurons has some kind of typing on it as well, which I'm not showing. So here you can see, again, ontology classes that type these individual neurons. There's a synapse to relationship here, and there's um, uh, which, okay, so I'll cover that first. So the synapse to relationship on that edge is the count of the, sorry, this one, the count of the number of synapses. So there's five synapses connecting these two neurons. Um, and we can use that, you know, we've got several million of these connections in the database right now. We'll, we're soon to get tens of millions more. Um, and we can use that in a circuit browser. So now I can query, here's one neuron, here's another neuron, give me the three shortest paths, three shortest, strongest paths between these neurons. So. Um, and we can render those by, uh, with semantic tags, and we can have the type information and the individual information on them. And then here, we also have um, neuron similarity scores. So um, these two neurons have a, a similarity score of 65, which is, which is pretty high. So this is like a BLAST-type system that compares neurons by their morphology. Um, so we can use that, and this finds um, uh, 72 neurons in the database that, that have high scores for this morphology. So this one's not too surprising because it's, it's classified as the same type, but there's lots of scope there for actually improving the classification of, of neurons in this way. We also have a system where people can upload and blast their, their neurons. Okay, so that's, actually that's basically it. Um, the limitations of future pounds. So I would say right now it requires some knowledge of ontologies, semantics, a cipher query language to work with. I think there's Cypher, I think, is quite nice because um, I've found that um, 
it's easier to find developers who are happy to learn a SQL-like query language than it is to, to get them to do Sparkle. And the fact that the, the nice thing about the way that we've done the Neo4j to OWL is, you can, is the biologist can look at it and it makes sense and it makes nice little network diagrams as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I think having some standard uh, data schema templates, so, you know, we can publish our standard ways for doing connectomes, for doing images, so building up a standard reference library of those, I think, would make things a lot easier as well. Um, uh, we're also looking at integrating Ubergraph, which is a way to, to make um, like complex OWL queries really easy. So all the inferred relationships um, from, from the ontology are just one link away. Um, I, don't, I don't have any more details on that, but I'm happy to talk about it further. Um, not in, the, in this talk. Another is that... The, Available ontologies are often really too complicated for a, for a particular use case, and I think this is just an inevitable consequence of the way ontologies develop. You have different funding at different times, and different people want different things. They get, and there are various things you need to do to make them tractable, to build them scalable, and they get complex. So you need, I think the way is not probably to simplify the ontologies themselves, but to find a way to generate simple views that work for people. So we've been doing some nice work on ontology views. Um, this is an old version of the slide, so it doesn't have the link to um, uh, Anita Caron's talk, uh, to Anita Caron's poster. Um, I think it's poster 36, 38, 36. Okay, Anita puts a thumbs up. So uh, if you're interested in ontology views, go visit Anita's poster, um, 36. Um, and uh, another limitation works best with consistently structured, logically consistent ontologies don't have any great solutions for that apart from saying try to build good ontologies but <laughs> um, okay we have a little bit on ontology view generation I think we, we want so here's an example of some work that Anita did this huge graph is just the kidney or most of the kidney terms and their connections um, plus cell ontology terms that sit underneath them and the ones in green are the ones that the human reference atlas people wanted so by just choosing those terms plus a simple set of relations that we wanted, in this case we only wanted part of and subclass of, we get really nice simple graphs out of it. Um, so I, I think this is definitely a way forward and we want to put that into the support for that into the pipeline. Um, okay, so there's Anita's poster, 36. Okay, and that's it. Um, so lots of different work here, um, all built on the ontology-based application starter kit, which, which is now a separate product, I think, because these are slightly older slides, they don't have the link, but we're on GitHub. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, virtual fly brain. The, the main people doing the work on the actually to turn this into a, to build this in the first place and then to turn it into a separate application, uh, Rob Court at, at VFB, Nico and Hussein also working at VFB, and then Ua Bayandir, um, who's done a... Um, a large amount of work on the uh, on the search endpoints uh, for the cell annotation platform. Okay, so I'll, thank you. I'll take questions. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, as somebody who appreciates the effort of software development, that's a nice talk. Um, I had two questions. One is, how would you compare your semantic tags to a slim ontology? And the second one was, you made it sound like creating a semantic tags was simple and easy, but it seemed to require a lot of knowledge of the users and what they wanted, and it also re seemed to require a definition for each of the semantic tags in terms of the ontologies. And I don't see either of those as being easy. Um, well, I, I suppose, I mean, any of us want to try and know what our user base would want and would have workshops and enough connections into the community. I mean, Virtual Flybrain is a small enough, serving a small enough community, I think we have a reasonable idea, and then do UX. Sure, it requires some knowledge of the ontologies to build the tags, um, but it's better than just dumping the ontology on the people with nothing else. Um, so I, I think probably it's partly something that has to go, you could, it has to be probably questions to the ontology developers if you don't develop the ontology directly or don't have a good, clear understanding of. But some of it's simple, some of it's just classification. 
And, and, and this, the, the subset, the, the slims? Slims on Tully. Yeah, just Sparkle Query. So. No, no, but the creating a semantic tag seems to me very similar to creating a slims ontology. No, I don't. I, slims typically are just manually tagged things. Uh, or, I mean, there's ways to generate. This is this is really to use the direct structure of the ontology, but to pull out the the power of the semantics and pull it out in some kind of easily accessible form for a particular application. So no, I don't think it's, it's it's not very similar to slims as I understand them. Although it's a hugely overloaded word. So thank you. We have 30 seconds. I'll just ask you one question. Okay. If I were to work on zebrafish mm -hmm. and I knock on your door and say, what can I use from what you have done to do the same on zebrafish? Um, <laughs> so, well, I mean, uh, there is a zebrafish anatomy ontology. It, uh, I guess the question is, to what extent you have annotated data? Uh -huh. if, you've got, uh, if you've got data annotated with usable ontologies, um, then it's pretty easy to fire the whole thing up. And then, you know, you've got to build some kind of front end on top of it, but sure. you've at least you've got a basis to work with. So, yeah, it, it's usable in as far as the annotations exist, sure. and, which I guess my impression for the zebrafish neurobiology is that they don't exist quite in the form that would be needed. Yeah, I, I've spoken with other people okay. about it. But probably for Z elegance, it would be pretty so, straightforward. Yeah, I've yeah. hesitated between the two. <laughs> I work on both.